Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved the wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind, but now I see. Twas time's sake, uh, we're going to go one, two, and four. One, two, and four. Stand, please, church. Please stand. We're gonna to go to two eleven. Two eleven. Hallelujah. Hallelujah for the cross. Oh yeah. Oh. 
seated. Oh, dear Lord, put a protective hedge around me on this one. Go to a white hymn book, number 67. Oh, come on. Number 67. Come on, <laughs> Let's go. Right before announcements? Damn. All right. Hey, uh, Brother Sean, what are you doing back there, brother? <laughs> <laughs> he is worthy. That's right. All right. Um, so we have uh, two pages of this one. Sorry about this. We're just going to go through the verses. Um, <laughs> When I, when I went over the song with uh, Brother Brent, um, uh, we're just going to go through the, the left side. So the left side, we should go through there. So when we get to the bottom, all hail, all hail, all hail, all hail, Emmanuel, it should go to verse 2. Okay. Okay. We'll go from there. All hail. Oh, 
Thank you, brother. Thanks for being patient with this church. So, um, if, if you weren't able to go to summer camp, um, please pray you can go next year. Uh, I think part of the reason we were having a little bit of a timing issue on that last all hail is because at summer camp, we literally held the note as long as we could. Uh, so, <laughs> so uh, yeah, we're, we kind of lost like what the actual progression of the song is. We just, yeah. <laughs> You're going to be doing that in heaven anyways, right? So for eternity. So sometimes it's, sometimes it's fun to do stuff like that. Welcome to San Jose Bible Baptist Church uh, for everyone who's able to make it. Uh, newcomers, uh, anyone we haven't seen before, we may have some newcomer cards uh, pass around. If you could fill those out, we would love to pray for you. I uh, want to let everyone know you're very welcome here. Uh, we had visitation today. A uh, few highlights. Uh, Brother Ray got saved. So a man named Ray. Um, profess faith in the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection. So he's a brother now. A um, couple other folks of note. Uh, we had a guy named Aaron who he just said he's never thought about it, never thought about dying, didn't really care. He's like, can I go back to cooking now? I'm like, okay, sure, yeah, just think about it because if you die without Jesus Christ, you're going to go to hell. And he's like, all right, I'll check it out. Thanks. Who knows? Another guy, Jermaine, he maybe kind of, sort of thought he could be saved. Um, so we tried to give him some assurance. We tried to drive that home. He was in very support of what we were doing. So please pray that if he's not saved, that he would get saved. And a um, lady named Alexa, she just believed everyone has faith in whatever they have faith in. And she was busy, so we let her know. Uh, also, don't get too busy because that's the devil trying to throw something in your life to where you won't get saved. So just pray for uh, all the folks that we were able to witness to today. Volunteer sheets should be making their way around um, at some point there as the Lord would lay upon your heart. Um, please volunteer to be a blessing for this church, whatever you're able to do. Whatever you do volunteer for, please try to do that faithfully as well. Um, it's actually better if you don't volunteer at all then volunteer and, and not do what you volunteered to do just because then people start depending on you. So however the Lord leads you. Um, newcomer cards as well will be going around. Uh, we're, we're also going to have our volunteer sheets for our Bible Baptist blowout speakers. As many of you know, we're trying to get a lot of speakers here, and we want to be a blessing to them. We want to uh, make sure that they're not having to come out of pocket and come give us something spiritually. Amen. Um, so... Uh, what, what you can do on that chart is put your name in a box underneath a speaker that you're committed to uh, faithfully supporting. We talked about it last week, but I, I think if an average of 10 mev members gave $36 a week between now and the blowout, it would completely pay for their trip. So once again, we're not, we don't believe in twisting arms, try anything like that, but however the Lord would lay it on your heart, we want to be a blessing to these speakers so they can be a blessing to us spiritually. Amen. Uh, Brother Chuck's funeral, um, just to reiterate, it's going to be at Lima Family Santa, uh, Family Santa Clara Mortuary, August 24th at 4 p.m. And may I please just get a raise of hands again from everyone who thinks they're going to be able to go, just, just so I can make sure. Well, one, two, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay. Okay. All right. It's not set in stone, so yeah, don't, don't worry about it if you're, you know, we, we're just trying to get as much information as possible so we can prepare. So it's about the same as last week. So uh, if you can make it, I think it'd be a real, you yourself will get a blessing uh, to see the impact that Brother Chuck had on so many souls, recovering alcoholics, um, drug you know, users. He had an open door, the AA for a long time, Salvation Army, veterans place. Like he, he did a lot for trying to get souls saved. So if you could show support as a church, as his church family, that would be wonderful. If you can't make it, don't worry about it, because he's not worried about it, amen? <laughs> he's, he, he's, he's up in heaven right now rejoicing at, at the feet of his Savior. Um, so uh, our memory verse, if you turn to Galatians chapter 5. We've been in Galatians chapter 5 for some time now. Such a great chapter dealing with the flesh versus the spirit. Galatians chapter 5. And this week, we're going to look at verses 24 and 25. 
Galatians chapter 5, verses 24 and 25. The Bible says, And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. Verse 25, If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. So you see there, just because, you, just because you're spiritually born again, you live, you live in the Spirit, you're living in Jesus Christ, that doesn't necessarily mean you're walking in the Spirit. You can yield to the Spirit, amen? And you're supposed to crucify your flesh. And so all throughout that chapter, we see all the polarity between the flesh and the Spirit. So verse 24 and 25, uh, try your best to memorize that this next week, and the Lord will bless you for it. Sorry, we have a special, the quartet. So... We have a special now, sorry. And then we'll do the then we'll do the offerings, so stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. Lift high his royal banner, it must not suffer. Lord indeed. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, the trumpet call obey. Forth to the mighty conflict in this his glorious day. He that our men now serve him against a numbered foe. strength oppose. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, stand in his strength alone. The arm of flesh will fail you, ye dare not trust your own. Put on the gospel armor, each piece put on with prayer. strife will not be long. This day the noise of battle, the next the victor song. To him that overcometh a crown of life shall be. He with the King of glory shall reign eternally. All right, we're going to take up the Lord's offering. I would like to ask uh, Brother Jesse and Brother Young co to come forward. Brother Jesse and Brother Young to come forward for the Lord's offering. All right, Brother Young, can you open up the offering with a word of prayer, please? Dear Father, Lord, uh, thank you for another Sunday where we can all gather and worship you and sing your glorious name. Lord, I want to pray for the offering that we give, not only to the church, but also to you as your speakers. I know you'll bless all the money that you <coughs> Thank you. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, please. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. You can choose to join the children downstairs, or uh, next door, excuse me, or downstairs, 
or you can sit through the service, that's fine too. I, won't, I promise I won't be that boring to the children, you know. <laughs> Second Corinthians. We're going to look at chapter 11, please, chapter 11. Uh, this is going to be totally off the cuff, what I'm going to be preaching today. Uh, I'm going to speak how the Lord leads my heart, what I'm feeling right now. And I don't know if the Lord will bless you in any way through this preaching today. Uh, I hope that he will bless you. Let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11. <clears throat> and we will read verse 23, please. Verse 23, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. We will read verse 23. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in deaths oft. Of the Jews five times received I forty stripes save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods, once was I stoned, thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I have been in the deep, in journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst and fastings often, in cold and nakedness, beside those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of of all the churches. So you'll notice right here that at verses 24 through 27, the Apostle Paul describes all the sufferings that he has to go through. And then at verse 28, Paul makes like an additional point at the end that besides all of these things, I have to even pastor and take care of churches. So you'll notice that the Apostle Paul, perhaps one of the number one Christians, who you will ever see in history, who went through so much hardship. And he knew how to deal with and how to handle pain. Now, uh, in our day and age, we have Bible believers who are going through hardship, who are going through pain, and they're going through tremendous attack from the world and the flesh and the devil. But I want us to learn something from the Apostle Paul, and perhaps that can be a blessing to you. But the way that I'm going to preach to you today is that I'll be preaching about myself. So as I preach more, that will be aimed toward me. If the preaching will aim toward you, understand and, and know that I'm preaching at myself right here, and that way maybe... If there is any pain that a minister goes through like Paul, maybe it can be the same thing with this minister right here who can relate to you in some way. So I hope that the preaching, it will help you as you go through tremendous hardship and trial and suffering in your life, and maybe the Lord can speak to you. So let's all start with the word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I am uncertain on how this sermon will come out, and I am uncertain of myself. But Heavenly Father, everything that I say and can depend upon is by the power of your Holy Spirit. All I can do, Heavenly Father, is rely on you to speak through me. The flesh right now, it does not want to speak. It does not want to preach, Lord. And I pray that you'll cast it, that wicked flesh aside and that the Holy Spirit will take control. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so I'm going to be realistic here. And maybe when I'm more realistic, it could be more helpful to you. So I do not believe, first thing, when I preach, I don't believe in being fantastical with you. I don't believe in touchy-goody feeling and then trying to say nice things just to make you feel better. Because the more that I realize that I try to talk that way, and then you're going through real pain, it doesn't reach you. It's not going to help you. And you're like, well, that's fine and dandy. I appreciate that. But all it did was it just made me feel good. It's not something applicable to me right now. It's not something practical helping me out right now. So if I say anything positive or anything negative, I'm just going to be realistic with you right here. 
So that's the first thing you got to understand that in order to live with pain is that you got to be realistic, not fantastical. And that's the first thing you got to understand. A lot of people, though, they want to escape to fantasy land. That's why they want to go to mega churches where they hear pastors say nice things while they're going through pain because that's their only medicine is nice, fluffy words. But when they're by themselves in the privacy of their own home and no one's watching them, you don't have those fluffy words with you. And when you, you need something at that moment. And I'll tell you what you're feeling right now at that moment in the privacy of yourself. It does not feel good. And that's what you got to be realistic. You got to be realistic that I'm living with this. I'm feeling this. And it doesn't matter what I hear. It's not helping me out right now. There are times when you pray and read the Bible. There are times that when you hear the preaching of the word of God from a Bible-believing, genuine preacher that can help you here and there. But let's be honest is that it doesn't reach all the way and eliminate the painful feeling that you're going through. So let's be realistic here. You think that when you pray to the Lord that it will magically go away? You got to realize this. There are times that the Lord will send you down his peace from heaven. And it's a peace that's beyond understanding. But you got to realize this. It's not some kind of drug and heroin where you feel good and then it goes 24-7. You got to re be realistic here that this is pain. This is reality and I'm living with it. And if you want to survive, if you want to live for Jesus Christ, if you want to be able to triumph over pain, you got to learn to accept your pain. And that's the difficult thing is that you can't learn to accept the pain. You can't learn to accept the hardship because the pain and the hardship, it's going to be hurtful. It's going to be difficult. It's going to be hard for you. So that's why what you need is that you can't just feel good and that you got to learn to accept it. You've got to learn to accept the pain. The more that you feel like, Lord, take it away, the more it's going to sink in the stress many times. And so you need to learn to accept the pain based on the promise of Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. And the peace that you can gain after that is accepting the pain. Not rejecting the pain, not ignoring the pain, not neglecting the pain, but learning to accept the pain. But the reason why people cannot accept the pain is because when they go down to the specifics of it and they wonder, well, uh, what if this happens? You know, I can see that if, I, if this bad thing continues on, it's going to get worse and worse. So what am I going to do? And then you start to feel burden. You start to feel uh, incredibly, uh, a lot of fear and worries start to cloud your mind. And then you, you try to trust and obey for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. But you can't. You might say, why can't I do that? It's because when you start to go to the specifics of thinking. And when you go to the specifics of thinking, you're like, what if God allowed this to happen? What if God allowed that to happen? Okay, I know that all things work together for good, but man, I sure don't want that bad thing to happen. Can I give you some good word of advice when you start to think specifically that way? God might do two things on you. You ready? God might let that bad thing happen that you fear the most if you keep thinking like that just to teach you something. The second thing is this. The second thing is God might not let that happen to teach you a lesson. Every time you predict something bad, it didn't turn out that bad, did it? You know what God does in this pain process? He's always a teacher, not a person who tries to make you feel good. 
You might say, well, but I need to feel good. I need that peace. Don't we all? And didn't Jesus Christ want to feel good when he was on the cross? Didn't Jesus Christ want to feel good when he lived 33 and a half years in human flesh? When he had no pillow to lay his head down upon? When Jesus Christ was mocked and spitting upon? Don't you think Jesus Christ wanted to feel good as well? But he's a person that understands how we feel in our flesh. And he was an all... Points tempted like as we are, yet without sin, Christ, he can feel the touch of our own infirmities because he was human flesh. But you got to understand and realize that if God took away the pain that you're feeling, then you get rid of reality. Reality in this sinful, painful world is there has to be pain. There has to be hardship. There has to be sorrow. We confuse Revelation chapter 21 where the Bible says no more tears, no more sorrow, no more death, no more crying. We confuse that in our life right now. We apply that verse to us right now. That is not the case. Before that even happens, there must be death. There must be tears. There must be pain. There must be. You don't like it so far, right? But this can help you if you learn to accept that. But see, our flesh refuses to accept it. You need to learn to accept it. But where can I find the peace with that, Pastor? The peace you can find with accepting that pain is trusting in God who's teaching you that he can hone it to something better and hone you for something better. And when you start to think specifics on what if God does this, what if God does that, he will let these certain specifics occur to teach you something. So my flesh has always been in the habit of always thinking specifics and specifics. And when you become a minister, that becomes habitual. You know, so-and-so there and so-and-so there. And then this predicament here in the church and that predicament right here. And now I got the internet of the whole world on my shoulder. That makes things way easier for me, right? Oh, I got to think about this and this one and this one. But then, because my flesh has constantly gotten into the habit of thinking these specifics, and the Lord always teaching me a lesson with those specifics, like this bad thing didn't even happen. Or when I thought that specific thing that would happen, it did happen, my flesh finally got sick and tired of it. And because I got sick and tired of it, my flesh finally learned to just give up. Just completely give up. It gave up and it said, you know what, just stop thinking about it and let it go. And then when I started to like completely go blank and not think about it anymore, that's when God started working and moving. You know why? Because that's what it means to truly let go. That's what it truly means to trust God is when you literally just let it go. You literally just get sick and tired. You're like, zero, zero. The devil comes and, what if that bad thing's happened? Well, let the bad thing happen. All things work together for good. Well, it's going to be really bad. Well, I'm not going to think about that. But if you want to think about that, okay, think about that. Okay, worry, flesh. Worry, worry, worry. How did you feel now? You feel better? I do that. I play games with my flesh. And that's battling. So what will help you to gain victory over the sufferings that your flesh is going through is to teach this flesh a valuable lesson. Why don't you teach this flesh a lesson? Why don't you play games with this wicked being? You got to start teaching this flesh a lesson. Why don't you just look yourself at the mirror? Dr. Upman said this one time and look at your flesh in the mirror and say, you're dead. That's what you need to do. That's what you need to do. A lot of us are concentrated on the world and the devil that we don't concentrate ourselves. And you got to realize the greatest enemy is the flesh and not the world and not the devil. You might say, really? Yeah, because you're living in this guy. You're feeling this guy. You got to realize Satan has no power against your free will. Amen. Oh, that's right. He can't do anything at the end because he has to go by the boundary lines and the permission of God Almighty. But this flesh, you do feel things every single time. And that's why Satan's trying to find a loophole. And that's how he can get to you is if, if your flesh allows a window of opportunity. 
So that flesh is the root key and the root evil. So you need to battle this flesh. Why did Paul say that all the time he has to live and fight and battle the flesh? In order to conquer suffering, you have to battle this flesh, you got to understand. That's what you got to understand. You got to battle the flesh. Sometimes we're so focused on some other spiritual plane in our spiritual warfare that we neglect the flesh as part of our spiritual battle. We're so focused on Satan and the gates of hell and then the false teachers out there and then the Judas Iscariots in the church and all the other problems and complications. But you don't realize that the greatest Judas Iscariot, the greatest enemy, the greatest devil is yourself, is this wicked flesh. And if you were to look at yourself, you would gain so much more peace after that. So much more strength against the enemies out there. You cannot conquer the enemies, any enemy out there, if you cannot defeat yourself. If you cannot gain victory against yourself, your flesh. If you are to win against this wicked being right here, then you will gain victory in all sorts of things in life. So you got to realize that this is public enemy number one. And then you need to look at this thing. And then you need to play games with it. You need to, if this flesh starts being skeptical of God, why don't you be skeptical of yourself, huh? You know, you know what the problem with people nowadays is that we get skeptical of the preacher and the word of God. We get skeptical of Bible-believing truth. But then uh, we don't get skeptical of our own selves. You know why? This is a fleshy tendency right here. If you're more skeptical of yourself rather than other things out there, your life and thinking will change so much dramatically. And then your wisdom and knowledge will increase tenfold. Maturity will increase tenfold. And not only that, the fruits of God will increase tenfold. And the peace of God and the blessing of God that you longed for and addicted for all that time will finally come down. So you need to be skeptical of Mr. Flesh. If the flesh starts to make you doubt God, you'd start doubting your flesh. Tell your flesh this, what if that doesn't happen? What if uh, God is, it, it's not possible that God would answer the prayer to the way you want it? Well, what if it is possible that God answers the way that I want it? Amen. Isn't it possible? Don't scriptures support that? Yeah. Well, what if this, uh, you know, that scripture, you know, maybe it doesn't really apply in your case, that situation. And tell your flesh this, what if it does apply in that specific situation? What if you're just wasting my time right now thinking these thoughts when I should be going out and playing golf now? Start critiquing your flesh. Flesh says, oh, uh, I want to cry, I want to cry. And then you, you tell your flesh this, okay, then cry. Just cry. Scream your heart out. Be, be a baby. Okay, wah, wah, wah. And then tell your flesh this, did that feel better now? Do something like that. Sometimes when we try to hold back, yeah. and then it just uh, it builds up the fleshy temptation even more. Yeah. So sometimes maybe just tell your flesh, okay, do this and do that. How did it feel now, huh? It, feel, it felt great, didn't it? Praise the Lord. Teach your flesh a lesson. Play games with this flesh. Battle this flesh. This is all about strategy. This is all about warfare. Do something with this wicked being here. If you're to do it, then your life can change so much and you can grow so much in the spirit. And not only that, you can finally gain peace and blessing. A lot of times peace and blessing cannot come because flesh is in the way. You understand that. Mr. Flesh always blocks the promise of God, the blessing of God. And he wants to send it down on you, but then Mr. Flesh blocks it. And why am I preaching like this? Because I'm preaching... If it did hit you in some way, I'm not surprised. You might say, why is that? Because the more I realize I preach things that I'm talking about my own life, for some weird reason, it'll hit somebody out there. It'll hit somebody out there. So I'm being realistic about myself right here on what I do. A lot of people think that I'm Superman and that I'm immune and that et cetera. But you got to understand this. That's not the case. How did I come out like this is because I went through this years, years of battling, years of learning and teaching experience, fighting against this flesh, accepting suffering and trusting God and praying to him and seeing him pull through time and time again. 
So then because of that, my immune, I became more and more immune to problems now. So you got to realize this is that if you want to gain that kind of strength and that maturity is through practice. You got to realize some, this sounds nice that you've heard right now and you might be gung ho and then you might fight the flesh, but it's not going to come out the way that you want it to be. That's what you got to understand. You got to realize that it takes constant practicing. Practicing. It's like working out. You can't just lift a heavy weight automatically like that. But if you keep practicing, then you become more and more immune to the pain that accompanies it. So you got to realize this. It's constant practicing because you're living in a realistic, fleshy world. And this flesh does not learn how to become immune to pain until it goes through pain first. And there's great truth in that. The more you avoid pain, then listen up now. This is something important. The more you avoid pain, then the more chances that any pain out there will make you more sensitive to it and make you hurt more. That's why it's important to learn to go through pain, not run away from pain. Because the more you try to avoid pain, let me tell you something. Realistically, you'll never run away from pain. Never. Someday, in some point in your life, you don't think that any point in any point in your life, you're not going to hit pain? This is in the world of pain. Do you think God's lying that wherefore as by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin and so death passed upon all men, all men, for that all have sinned? It hits everybody. It's going to hit you some point in your life. Might as well be now. Might as well be now. Why? Do you want it later? Might as well get it now. While you're serving God, while you're in a spiritual plane, while you're in a Bible-believing world. Sometimes we get upset and we get hurt. Why doesn't it spiritual attack, suffering happen after summer camp? Maybe it's the mercy of God that he did it because that's when you're spiritually strong. If he did it later, then he'd know that you become weaker. And you'd fall away. Sometimes you got to think of it this way is sometimes try to see something positive from the plan of God through your suffering. You know what's going on with your flesh? The flesh thinks all the negative things that are going wrong with if that specific thing happened, then this bad thing will happen, and then that bad thing will happen. And then what you've got to do is tell yourself, what if something good, what if... God's doing that to produce this good thing. Put yourself, stop putting, stop trying to put God in your shoes because God's already in your shoes. He's in your heart. He knows what you're thinking. Why don't you, instead of trying to say, God, understand my pain, why don't you try to put yourself in God's mind and try to think what he's thinking? When you do that, that becomes a little bit more encouraging. As a pastor... A uh, pastor gets hurt when somebody doesn't come back to church anymore. But you know what I try to do now? I try to think this way. Maybe the person's going to be, cause a lot more pain and problems. Can you picture that? And then I'm like thinking, no, I can't picture that. And God's like, Don't, aren't you glad maybe then the person's gone? Yeah, I'll take the person away then. <laughs> oh, man, that's cruel. That's mean. No, you got to think of stuff like this where you can find more peace well, what if you're wrong for thinking that? Then I'm wrong for thinking that. Don't you think God's already in control, not me? God brings the person back. Praise the Lord. God brings the person back. I was wrong. God took the person away. Praise the Lord. He took the person away. It doesn't matter. The point is, whatever the result is, God's in control. That's the point. So start thinking positive things in your life on what God's doing. Start to think like that. Oh, man, the person came back to church and is going to cause problems with this and this, with this brother and this sister. That's the flesh talking. And then what do I say to myself? What if there's a positive thing like over there? Maybe that person is going to be one of the best members in the church. And usually I've seen it at churches. Sometimes a person who causes a lot of burden actually turns out to be uh, the one who was a liability became a great asset instead. Amen. Yeah, there were those times. Many times that has happened in my life. So whether the person's gone or come back, I always try to think 
All things work together for good. I try to think positive. You know what the problem with all of us Christians is that, you know, we get upset over something negatively preached, and then we get, uh, when we become negative in our flesh, we get upset of, about something positive preached. You know what the flesh just wants to feel? It just wants to feel whatever it wants to feel. That's the problem with the flesh. Whether I preach positive or negative, it doesn't matter. Your flesh will scream, no! Find peace in Jesus Christ. No, I want to worry. Be strong in the Lord. Go through the pain. No, I want relief. Well, then what do you want? I don't know what I want. I just want to feel. Okay, then do whatever. Be confused. And then I realize I look stupid. And, uh, and then I, I, I teach my flesh a lesson, all right? I'm like, okay, see, you're just confused. Calm down. Take 10, all right? What, what's the matter, okay? Stop hyperventilating, okay? Calm down, you know? You're okay. You're okay. See, that's the thing is that you got to start using, you got to start being in that spiritual world rather than so immersed in emotions and feelings. That's the problem. Emotions and feelings will always bring wrong judgment, so you need to, the emotions and feelings, especially the words that come out when you say it, if it comes from what your body is feeling, then that's the time where you got to be double on guard and be double skeptical. And you got to go, am I in the flesh right now? And literally in the flesh right now when I'm saying this, or am I in the spirit? So you need to start to get inside that spiritual plane Get your senses together, and while you're entering that spiritual world, you confront the emotion. You confront the lust. You confront the depression. You confront the temptation. You confront that addiction and then that feeling, whatever that has to do with emotions right here, whatever it has to do with something fleshy here. And then you look at Mr. Flesh, and then you start to interrogate Mr. Flesh, rather than interrogating God. We're so used to putting a seat right here and putting Jesus Christ and interrogating Jesus Christ. Why did you let that happen? I don't understand, God. You could have done something better like that, but you need to put yourself right here because you're the worst enemy and you need to interrogate yourself. You're so good at being skeptical and interrogating God, but you can't do that to yourself. You better be better in doing that against yourself than with God. If you do that more so with God and others, then you've got a problem. More. you got to interrogate more on yourself. That will give you more peace than anything imaginable. I'm telling you as a matter of fact. Interrogate yourself and you will find more peace than ever. It is your flesh that's the problem. It's not the problem that's giving, your fe- giving you fear. It's your, how you're feeling in your flesh that's giving you fear. Because even if the problem happens, if you crucify your flesh and you're in the spirit, do you think you're going to live in fear when God's not the author of fear? See, it doesn't happen whatever the storms happen. The lightning may flash and then the rain may pour. The winds may become boisterous and the waves might start splashing in you. But guess what? The disciples are still safe in the boat and Jesus is sleeping. Everything's all right. See, so the problem is not the waves. The problem is not the lightning. The problem lies within the people in the boat. It's you. Let the world go to hell as long as you're still standing on the rock. If you're standing on the rock, then you don't care about the problems that happen in life. I've learned that, oh, something bad happens in the church. Something bad happens online. Something bad happens in my life. I finally learned to just let them all go to hell then. Let it all happen. Who cares? I just, I just want to get up, eat my meal, go outside, get back to work. Amen. Oh, but this bad thing, let it happen. I don't care. I've learned to do that. I'm, I'm serious. You got to learn to say, I don't care. Let it happen. Because you know what you're doing? You're letting it go to God. You're letting Him handle it. Well, what if God works it that way? Oh, let it work that way. What if you die in a car? Oh, let me die in a car. I could care less. I'll go to heaven, you know. What if you get crippled? Oh, man, whatever, you know. I think I'll be happy. Let it happen. Blah, 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 whatever, you know. You got to learn to start letting it go and say, whatever, whatever. Whatever, flesh. 
This flesh, man, is just uh, very wicked. The more I realize that I'm trying to preach about going through suffering, the more I realize that the enemy and the problem is the flesh yourself. And it's not the It's not the circumstance. It's not the trial. It's not the devil. It's not the world. It's yourself. That's the problem. If you were to hit this person, then you can be able to gain more peace in God. Because you realize that he's got the very, every single, don't we believe every single atom, molecule, and element out there is under his control? The Bible says, by him all things consist. All things consist. All God has to do is snap his fingers and then boom, there goes your problem. There goes the, the, the addiction. There goes the discouragement. There goes the pain. It's just a bam like that. Just bam. What is there to fear when God is near? He's not just near. He is here. And when God is here... Everything's all right. Can I tell you something? Satan has no permission to attack you where you're going to break down mentally and cry and then where he can hurt and damage your life in the worst possible scenario. He absolutely has no permission. You got to realize that in Job chapter 1 and chapter 2, Job may have went through so much affliction, but there is still peace in those two chapters. You might say, how so? Because Satan always has to ask God's permission. And God always had to look at Job's welfare and say, I know that Job would appreciate this result later on. So you go ahead and do it, but just but don't put your hand on him. See, no matter how bad life is, Satan can't touch you. All right? They may even persecute my body, but look, Satan, he can't have you. He can't have it where you're going to break down and say, I, there's nothing I can do. No, God has you intact. God knows your limitation. God knows your sensitivity. God knows who you are. You know what, we, you know what our problem is? We think that uh, God is a hard God. That's the problem with that servant. That servant, when Jesus was coming and he didn't use his talent for the Lord, he said, I knew that you were a hard master. You've got to realize this. That is not God. You know what God is? If the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, and long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, and faith, does that sound like hard to you? That's from the fruit of the Spirit. God would be following the fruits of the Spirit more than you, don't you think? If he's all about love, gentleness, putting up with you, I'm putting up with you, I'm putting up with you, don't you think that he knows what's best for you? He knows how sensitive you are, and then he'll say, you can have this much, Satan, but not here, not there, not there. I know that my child will come to church Go to soul winning. Serve me if you take this and this and this from him or her. But right over here, no, not yet. Not yet. Because we critique so much on the gentleness of God, we don't learn to enjoy his gentle care right now. You got to realize this is that God right now, he has been providing your needs. He's been giving you the air that you breathe. He has given you opportunities to enjoy in life because of his great gentle hand and care and his grace but you don't learn to take advantage of it you got a husband you got a wife you got children you got a mom you got a dad you got a brother and sister in christ who always asks for your welfare who always prays for you you got a church you got a, a book in your hand that you can turn to for comfort You got physical things on this earth you can enjoy. Look, if you're in America, man, you can drive any place that you want. You can go any fast food joint that you want. Pick up any snack that you want. You can do anything that you want. Now take opportunity with the freedom and the grace and his gentleness that he's provided for you. We don't learn to enjoy his gentle care. In fact, we want something else he wants to be gentle on. Not this pain, not this problem, Lord. And God's like, no, I gave that to the devil. But 
I know which part I'm gentle with you on. Why don't you turn to that now? You know what your problem is? You turn to what you select, what you desire to choose for your comfort, for your gentleness. Rather than what God has given to you right now. What I turn to for my comfort, for my joy, when I'm all alone, when I'm pastoring a church, when I have problems inside the church and problems with enemies outside, what do I do? I'll tell you what I do. I start to count my blessings. I look at the things that I have that other people don't have. And then I try to think of things that the Lord blessed me with that other people are jealous about and don't even have. And then I learn to be more thankful. I learned to realize I'm very spoiled. I learned to realize that I'm truly blessed. And then I start to realize that, how can you be so weak after that? So then start looking at yourself on what God has blessed you in. And look, I guarantee you this. You've got something that somebody out there or somebody, no, no, let me put it this way. I guarantee every single one of you has a physical blessing that somebody in this room would be jealous about that they don't have. And you don't start to think that way. You need to look at things like, what do I have that so-and-so does not have? And then you learn to be more grateful, more peaceful. Especially when the other person is going through a problem. And when you're going through a problem yourself too, and then you realize you're in a better plane compared to that person in this room, you've become more in peace after that. That's what you got to do. You got to start comparing yourself to other people. Compare yourself with other people on how more blessed you are, what they would be jealous about, and what you have that they don't have. And then when you start to think that way, then you learn to enjoy those particular things more. That's what you need to do. You need to focus on what God has blessed you with, what God has provided for you. He did that with Job. He realized Job would prefer this outcome at the end, which is why he allowed those problems to happen. And what helps your flesh find more peace is to tell your flesh this. You got to tell your flesh that, okay, then let's say that God does things the way that you want it to be. You want that way to happen? How much more peace you'll have after that? Or are you gambling right now and it's going to become worse for you? And that actually helps me and puts the fear of God in me. And I've learned to stop worrying and stop begging God to put things my way and getting upset at God. I've learned to just let it go and say, God, I prefer your way. Yeah, it's because I put the fear of God in me by God saying, okay, you want me to do it that way, child? And I go... And then God's like, I thought you wanted me to do that way. And then I'll tell my flesh, I thought you wanted it to be that way. Do you want it that way? The flesh starts to tremble a bit. And it's like, blah, 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 blah. And then I start to tell the flesh, yeah, you don't have anything now, right? Okay, so shut up. Never mind, Lord. You got to interrogate your flesh here. When you're in that feeling right now, you need to picture, you need to be in that spiritual plane and look at Mr. Flesh. And sit down with Mr. Flesh and sit down with Jesus. That's what you need to do. You're in your own therapy room right now. So you need to put Jesus right here. And then you need to, Dr. Jesus right here. You need to put the flesh right here. And then you need to put yourself right here. Okay? Rather than the flesh going behind your back and being your therapist, you need to put Jesus Christ in front of you. And then put the flesh right on the couch and interrogate him. That's what you need to do. You need to interrogate your flesh. And while you're feeling that pain, while you're going through that pain, you need to do that at that moment. And then interrogate that flesh of yours. And then the flesh screams, well, I want to do it this way. I want to do it that way. And then you know what I do? I look at Jesus and say, this is what my flesh is saying, Lord. This is what my flesh wants. And then Jesus tells me, okay, you want me to do it that way? And then I look at Mr. Flesh. Okay, so you want him to do it the way you want it? Uh, blah, 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 I don't, know. I don't know, I don't, okay, then shut up. Okay, what's the next thing you want to complain about, Mr. Flesh? Interrogate it, go through everything the flesh is feeling. And then start to go through everything, and then you give it to the Lord in prayer, see? And that's what it means to dump all your burdens, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. 
and then you relay it to Jesus, and then Jesus will start to speak to you, and then you speak back to that flesh. This is a crazy thing we live in. It's a strange little being, strange little thing, man, strange thing. The Holy Spirit can give more peace than you can ever imagine, but the flesh has always been your limitation. And once those boundary and limitations are broken, then the Holy Spirit can just pour out so much blessing upon your life. Can I encourage you with this is to not let Mr. Flesh hold you back. And when you pray to the Lord, I mean, the problem with many of us is that we hold it in. We hold it in, we fight it, we fight it, we fight it. But the more you do that, then the more unhealthy it becomes. Dr. Jesus is in front of you. He wants to hear what you're going through right now, what the flesh is putting you through. You feel like that you can't say it to Jesus. Dr. Jesus says, no, tell me. And you're like, oh, I can't tell you. It would be a sin, you know. And the flesh is like harassing you, beating you and saying, see, that doctor doesn't really care for you. You see, you know, they said that in the verse, but, you know, if Jesus really cared, he would do this. And why don't? And then you're holding it all in. you got to tell God what your flesh is saying. you got to say, okay, God, here's my problem right now. This sounds blasphemous, so I'm going to tell you this, God. This is my flesh saying it. You know my heart, Lord. I don't want to say it. It's my flesh. So I'm going to tell you what my flesh is saying. And I'm going to say it to the Lord. If you say it to me, you say it to anybody else, then, yeah, you're just doing so many things that we're going to go, whoa. But God knows what you're thinking, what you're feeling, and he's the only one that you can tell. And then you go like, this is what my flesh is saying, God. Blah, blah, blah. And that's not me, Lord. You know my heart. I don't want to say it. But that's what my flesh is saying. And when you do that, there's a lot more peace after that when you let it go to the Lord and cast your care upon him for he careth for you. Every dark secret and every dirty word and then every wrongful emotion that you're like, how can that even come out? But Jesus already knew. I don't know. People here don't know, but Jesus already knew. Just to tell him. Don't you think he already knows? <laughs> I can't say it to him. It's blasphemous. Don't you think Jesus already knew? He knows what you're thinking right now. So just say it to him and let it go in his hands. And then the, when I learn to contradict my flesh and to interrogate my flesh and to tell my flesh, okay, so if you want the way that you wanted to do, then go for it. And then my flesh will get the fear of the Lord in it and say, oh, I don't want to do it because I'm scared to do this and that. And I say, okay, then shut up. And then the more that I do that, the more that I learn to understand what peace is, the more that I learn how to accept more peace, and the more I learn how to simmer the worries and the feelings of this flesh that comes up. Because everything is through a learning process. But Satan wants to dull your mind and wants you to go by how you feel. When I preach this sermon today, if I went by how I felt, then I can't preach a single thing to you. You saw how I started off in prayer. My flesh don't want to preach. And I'm honest right now. My flesh don't want to preach right now. You might say, really, pastor, how dare you? Hey, guess what? You're going to have a Sunday somewhere if you're preaching every, uh, if you're preaching a couple times every week. You're going to hit one of those moments where, oh, I don't want to preach today. I don't want to teach today. That's what's going to happen. But guess what? I just do it anyway. I just do it, and then the Holy Spirit leads. If I went by how I felt, then you get nothing. I tell my flesh, it doesn't matter how you feel. You just got to speak. That's what the Lord wants. I just speak it out, and the Lord guides it. So the best thing to do is to always let that mind work because that's why the Bible says be sober, be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. And the, the, devil's, the devil knows that if you dull your mind and go by how you feel, like a heavy drinker, like a drug addict, that's what you would love to feel. That's what the route you would go for is 
Why do you want God to take away the pain? Because you want to feel. Why do you want God to give you comfort? Because you want to feel. Why do you want the preacher to say something fluffy? Because you want to feel. But that's not, if you always go by how you feel, guess what? You'll never gain peace. How you gain peace is that you start to think. And you start to battle. And you interrogate that flesh. And peace is attained at the end. Peace is not gained until you go through conflict. The blessing don't happen until you go through hardship. Victory is not attained until you go through trial and testing. If any of you are out there going through some kind of hardship, problem, or suffering, the Lord Jesus Christ, he always extends his arms open wide and he says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are in heavy laden, and I will give you rest. But flesh is a limitation always. He's blocking you. And he's saying, don't go to Jesus. Break that flesh. Don't be bound by your limitations. And let Jesus Christ flood your life. And let him truly have it his own way. And you truly let anything happen out there. You tell the flesh, let anything happen out there. For I'm sheltered safe in the arms of God. Every head bow and every eye shut. The altar call is open. I don't know what you're going through, but if you have something that you want to lay it out to the Lord, you can come forward here on the altar's floor and then dump it to the Lord. If the flesh is holding you back, don't let the flesh hold you back. We give you this time where you could pray in your seats or you can come here on the altar's floor. It doesn't matter how you choose, but this is a chance where you can bow your head and close your eyes and then... Just spend time praying to the Lord. If there's anything in this sermon that helps you, that's your time where you can pray that to the Lord right now. Are you going through pain? Are you going through hardship? Then let the Lord Jesus Christ take over your life. Let him truly take over. There's something you're holding back. You're not letting him take it over. Just let it go. Let the flesh learn to let it go and let God when you let go, you're letting God. You just add the D at the end of go, and it's God. <laughs> let go and let God. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Thou art the potter, I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will, why, while I am waiting, yielded and still. I also want to say this too. If God chastises his child, the Bible says, whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. So even if God does this out of punishment, the, the great news is this. This is so amazing. Even when he punishes you, that's the more preferable way that you choose rather than your own way. That's how much peace you gain at the end. It's truly unlimited peace. Truly unlimited peace is letting God doing it the way he does things, the way he wants. If you go by the way you want it, it's going to ruin the plan. It's going to make things even worse. Maybe the Lord has something that you didn't thought about that might happen at the end. If you tell God to take away the pain, maybe that pain is the only thing that can bring the desired result that you've been praying for all that time. Or the thing that you longed for all that time. You ever thought about that? Maybe God knew that pain is the only thing that can do it. And if you, got, if you ask God to take away that pain, then it just ruined his entire plan, his entire system of bringing you the desired result that you longed for and wanted. Let God have his way in your life and let him take full control, and there will be unlimited peace. Isn't that the Holy Spirit's job to give you peace, not hardship? Isn't it the Holy Spirit's job to fill your heart with love rather than fear and worry? Isn't that the Holy Spirit's job? And why are you worried? Why are you fearing? Why, why, why are you afraid to let, let anything happen? Let anything happen because anything and everything is under God's hand. He is in control. Let anything happen. Let everything happen. 
And then, you know what? That's always the betterment. That's always the best is whatever he desires, what he plans for. Every life that has vanished and passed away is in God's control. Every breath that you take in is under God's control. Every teardrop that a person has shed was under God's control. He has everything in the palm of his ultimate plan, and that's where you can find just utmost peace and just letting it go. Just letting it go. Do you think God's worried that he's wringing his fingers? Oh, I'm worried. What am I going to do? This ruined everything. Have the peace. God, my Father, I pray that today's preaching has helped people. They need encouragement. They need comfort. They need, they need you, Lord. They need you, Heavenly Father. And I pray that you'll fill it within them. And Lord, it's not something that we can touch or we can feel. We sure appreciate some of that. But Heavenly Father, it's ultimately what we need to learn where we can gain that comfort and peace and that blessing. I pray we learned it. I pray that our flesh will learn it. The only way our flesh will learn it is if in that very moment we're going through the pain and we're interrogating that flesh. That's when we finally learn it, Lord. It would be sad that we never learn it, and because we never learn it, that's why we never get peace. That's why, Lord. May we start learning now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Out of all the wrong doctrines that's happening in our day and age at the last days of the church, as the apocalypse is coming even closer, the point of all this, friend, is that you won't be even able to grow in knowledge of the truth, in Bible-believing truth, until you get saved first. The most important question you have to ask yourself after watching all this is if you were to die today, are you 100% sure that you're going to go to heaven? Perhaps one of these wrong doctrines have affected you and you had the improper way of salvation. As you have seen before, the way to get saved is very simple. It's only simply salvation by grace alone without works through the Lord Jesus Christ in this Christian day and age. If you're not sure that you can go to heaven after you die, it's very simple to get saved. First of all, you have to understand that because of sin, God is a holy God, and He cannot even allow 1% of sin into heaven. So He has to judge sin with a burning hell. So it is very important that you got to realize how serious sin is, and you must repent. You might say, well then, I guess I have to clean up all my sins. I guess I have to go to church. I guess I have to get baptized. I have to, I have to be a good person. No, my friend, good works can never save you. Jesus is God who died, buried, and resurrected so that he can pay all the sins for you. You don't have to pay a single sin for yourself. So all you have to do as a repentant sinner is turn to what he did on the cross alone for your salvation. You might say, well, pastor, I do believe only on what Jesus did on the cross to save me. That's great. Then all you have to do is just say that to the Lord. You might say, well, preacher, I haven't prayed much before in my life. I don't know really how to say it to God. Can you help me out? Sure, you can say it this way. Dear God, I know I'm a sinner. As I repent, I put my faith that Jesus is God and that he died, buried and resurrected so that his blood can wash away my sins. I put my faith in that alone to save me, not my good works. In Jesus' name, I pray, amen. Congratulations, my friend, if you meant it with all your heart that you put your faith only on what Jesus did on the cross through his blood to save you, then you are saved. It's that simple, my friend. Now, my friend, it is important to grow in Bible-believing truth. You now know the truth. What are you going to do about it? As the apocalypse comes even more closer and Satan's about his, to set up his kingdom even more, there are many souls dying and going to hell, and even many more churches out there who don't know right and wrong doctrine. It is up to you now on what to do. 
and go to our resources site www.bbcenglish.org and click on the resources link over there and it'll give you everything that you need to grow in grace. The next step of your journey now is up to you. We've done our part giving you this movie. All of it was done for free by the love of the people. God bless you. Or should we just stick to the Sermon on the Mount? A passage that is so radical that it's doubtful that our own defense department would survive its application. King James onlyism is double standards. Now there's a false doctrine out there called dispensationalism. Yeah, I, I don't believe one saved always saved. The God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all fiction. Jealous and proud of it, a petty, unjust, unforgiving control freak a vindictive, bloodthirsty ethnic cleanser, a misogynistic, homophobic, racist, infanticidal, genocidal, filicidal, pestilential, megalomaniacal, sadomasochistic, capriciously malevolent bully. But you don't want to get identified with the reproach of what really believing this Bible is all about. You know what these wicked left-wing liberal perverts want you to do? Legalizing the marijuana or homosexuality or if the whole entire world turns against the Lord. Is that person saved? Is that person on their way to heaven or hell? The common kind of person has no thought of God in their mind. That people will leave the church over the color of the carpet. What's wrong with our churches? Why don't we have a closer walk with Jesus? Why isn't everybody running around like little Jesus and shouting, screaming, and hollering? That thing you look in the mirror, it don't want to go street preaching. It don't want to read the Bible. It don't want to pray. It wants to watch TV and a bunch of other junk. A lot of you don't have it because you're lazy. That's why you don't have it. Because you won't work. That's why. Don't you know the Bible says, Whoa! Unto the wicked! And I'll tell you, Jesus Christ loved you enough. He came down here, put up with your dirty wages. The wages of sin is death. When you offer somebody a gospel track, if uh, you're walking away and you see them throw it on the ground, that's not because they're afraid of what's in it, they know what's in it. No matter where you are today, turn to God and place your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And God Almighty got me through and got me through for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, 25 years, 30 years, 35 years, 40 years. You mess with that book, honey, I'll mess with you. Shame on you if you don't read the Bible. Shame on you if you don't read the Bible. Shame on you if you don't witness with Jesus Christ. Shame on you. I like to whip that smile out of you. Give me your power, Lord. You know what we need? We need people to fall on their knees. We need people to pray to the Lord, raise the King James Bible high, believe in this sensational truth. And Lord, I just don't want their power. I pray like Elisha, double the portion, Lord. Give it within me. Give it within me the filling of your spirit. Give me your power, Lord. Give me your power. Give me your power. And God, the Holy Spirit, will move upon this church and fill within him his Holy Spirit power. Amen. Then we'll see soul saved. Then we'll see God do something with this truth. Then we'll see the liberals and the homosexuals getting a thing. Then we'll see those apostate Christians getting mad. Then we'll see all the world opening their eyes to the truth and they say, yeah, we have not seen such a thing. Brother, sister, there's only one hope. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearance of the Man. man God. Yeah. 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 Jesus Christ. Yeah.